Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know. So how does it work? Okay. Uh, okay. Now I just say new page. Okay. So, um, so Well, so, okay, so, so, you right. So, I mean, somehow, right, somehow we managed, I managed to talk a lot about these line bundles and this near and severity group while just sweeping the whole Picard variety under the table. I never even mentioned it. It seemed like somehow, you know, directly from this uh, Riemann form, I seemed to manage to cook up a, uh, a holomorphic line bundle. Um, and um, so the idea is you, in this funny approach, you start with a let's see. Should I say? Uh, well, for a while, like you were talking about two co cycles to get it like a topological. Yes. Line bundle. Yes. And we could still think that way. Yes. And then was it equipping it with extra structure to get it to be a holomorphic line bundle or equip just an extra uh, yeah, property? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so um, you, know, you, need, structure. You, you need, uh, well, so we, so we start out with this two cos cycle, but for some reason we, we make it a very nice two cos cycle, which is, um, anti-symmetric and bilinear. And that's without loss of generality because you know those are actually the representatives of the cohomology classes. So you can actually use that standard representative co-cycle, two co-cycle of the cohomology class. And, um, and yeah, that gives you a topological uh, line bundle no problem, or perhaps better thinking of it as a U1, topological principle U1 bundle. Um, uh, but then if we have a complex structure on our universal cover, a complex vector space structure on our universal cover of this uh, torus, then we can start thinking about it being, uh, you know, a, a, making this into a holomorphic line bundle, holomorphic Hermitian line bundle. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so first you randomly pick the complex structure. Uh, then you could, there's, there's a couple of different ways of, of thinking about it. You could, you could use the complex structure to, um, to, you know, transform the anti-symmetric bilinear form into a symmetric bilinear form, and you can put the, and you can put those together to form a uh, a complex valued form. But let's see. But I think it's an it's it's an extra property that this actually forms a a, her, a Hermitian form that everything fits together, right? And because we don't want it to always work. I mean, it should be a non-vacuum. That's center. right. That's right. That's right. So there must be yeah. There must be that condition, and it is just you know the usual Hermitianness, Hermitian compatibility between these three components: the anti-symmetric bilinear form that becomes the imaginary component, the symmetric bilinear form that becomes the real component, and the uh, the complex structure. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and we want that all that compatibility condition to imply or really to be equivalent to uh, the fact that the descent method works, that you get this, you lift the action of the period lattice on the base, you lift it um, with the help of these, with the help of this Hermitian form, you lift it uh, to an action of the refined period lattice on the, uh, on the trivial bundle over the, universal cover. And then we want to prove that this 
compatibility condition is equivalent to this, um, this lifted action being an action by holomorphic maps. And once you have that, then you can use that to, you can take the orbit space and that orbit space will be the, 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 the total space of the descent line bundle. And it will be, you know, it will live in the whole, it, because it was an action by holomorphic maps, when you take the orbit space, that will be holomorphic. So everything, if we do this correctly, everything should fit together and we'll get a holomorphic line bundle that way, but it should have depended on this compatibility condition. So yeah, so, so we start out with this being a sufficient condition, this compatibility condition, we start out with it being a sufficient condition to get uh, the, uh, to get this holomorphic structure on the line bundle. Uh, so that's being a sufficient condition, but then, you know, we'd like it to be a necessary condition as well. And, you know, we use the usual strategy for proving a necessary condition when you already have the sufficiency, uh, proving the necessity when you already have the sufficiency. And that, that strategy is, you know, sort of try to make sure that all the work you did was sort of reversible. And the thing that really helps this, all this work to be reversible is that it ends up that this whole holomorphic Hermitian line bundle that we constructed has this churn connection on it. And, and it's, from, it's exactly from that churn connection that you can reverse engineer um, this thing that we started with, this, this Riemann form. So we, we end up with it being a sufficient, necessary and sufficient condition, this, you know, this Hermitian compatibility. Um, you know, which in particular cases cuts down our neuron severity group. Uh, you know, it started out with this six dimensional lattice of uh, anti symmetric bilinear forms, but um, it gets cut down sometimes to a four dimensional. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I, I was talking about the case of an abelian surface. In the case of an abelian surface, it's this six dimensional lattice. And um, we've been experimenting with cases where we see it gets cut down to four dimensions, but perhaps also other cases where it gets cut down to one dimension, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so somehow we managed to do all this. I managed to, well, <laughs> there's, still, right, there's still details to check here. I really want to you know, eventually show you the proof that this actually all works. Yeah, good. But, yes. But, um, but somehow I managed to get this far without ever uh, even worrying about the continuous parameter in the classification of the line bundles. And um, so I understand a little bit about that now. And it's very suggestive. I, I don't have a really great picture of it yet, but it's very suggestive that's going to be very nice. Um, so I'll try to tell you what I have so far. And, you know, I can, I can go home and work on it more, or maybe we can figure out something. So um, what am I trying to say here? Well, well, first of all, I gave you a preliminary answer last time. Uh, I said something like, uh, you know, once you define this automorphy condition or this lifted action, uh, that you can just drag that around. To, you know, you can just pretend that a different point in, in your vector space is now the origin of your vector space. And you can drag that around, and that will actually give you a different uh, a line bundle, um, a, a different a different hol holomorphic line bundle. The holomorphic structure on the line bundle will be different, and uh, so that makes it sound like the, this continuous parameter is actually just picking a point in the abelian variety itself. But then you pointed out that well, according to textbooks, it's actually supposed to be a point in the dual abelian variety. And in fact, if you look at this dragging thing, you know, if 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 you have a non-ample line bundle, like if you have you know the trivial line bundle, then the automorphy condition is pretty much vacuous, and you start dragging that around, that's not going to go anywhere, right? I mean, that's you can't drag the. It doesn't change, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Did I say? Vacuous. What, what am I trying to say? I, I, vac, vac, say this saying though is vacuous. That was the wrong thing to say. It's just ordinary translation invariance. If you drag ordinary translation invariance around, it's still just translation invariance. Uh -huh. But 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 again, we see that it you know it's it's sort of the degeneracy 
that causes the failure of dragging around to account for the continuous parameter. But, but right, that's very promising. That makes perfect sense because um, you know, we're supposed to be getting the, uh, the dual abelian variety. Um, but you know, in the case where we had the form itself being non-degenerate, we got something dual to that. So, you know, it, 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 it looks like we just have to do things more carefully and, 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 and we'll see that it really does involve the dual abelian variety rather than the abelian variety. So in fact, let's, let's, try to, let's, 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 try to, let's try to think about that right now. So what am I trying to say? Let me try to write down the, uh, the automorphy condition. So it's something like what? Uh, well, okay. So we have what? We have a, do, do you have any preferred notation here? We're starting with a free abelian group of some even rank. Oh, I call it L for lattice. L for lattice, okay. L is for lattice. So it's a free abelian of rank uh, 2D. Okay. And um, now we have an anti symmetric bilinear integer valued form on that. Do you have a preferred notation for that? Do we call it A or B or anything like that? I don't know. Uh, a is fine. Okay. So A is anti symmetric. Bilinear, um, I guess where, where it's going from L cross L, maybe people write Cartesian product as like a, an X or something like that. L Cartesian product L to the integers mm -hmm. and it's uh, anti-symmetric bilinear, yeah. And, um, And then what have we got? We've got uh, well, I guess, okay. So, okay, let's say, um, C is a complex structure. On what? On um, a tensor the reals. Okay. On L tensor the reals. L tensor the reals. Okay. Uh, let me. Uh, L. Tensor the reals. Okay. And um, so what's going on here? So, so, uh, sorry. All right, this, re this, this is like old fashioned blackboards that you move them up and down or whiteboards. Um, so what am I trying to say here? Uh, that we have this automorphic condition F of, all right, so don't, don't tell me anything about it for a second. So this is supposed to be, uh, Right, okay, so I should have a variable V that's ranging over this uh, complex vector space. So I have F of V plus uh, a period. 
So P, P is a period, it's an element in the lattice. Um, v is a vector, it's, it's an element in this complex vector space. Uh, so it's equal to F of V times the exponential of uh, the Hermitian inner product that comes from A uh, evaluated at V comma P. Um, you know, so that Hermitian inner product that comes from the anti-symmetric bilinear form, you know, A becomes the imaginary part. And, um, and the real part is this symmetric thing that you get from the anti-symmetric thing by, you know, multiplying one of the inputs by I. Uh-huh. Um, so this is supposed to be pretty manifestly holomorphic if you stare at it right. And, it, but it really relies on this being Hermitian and everything so that, you know, the Hermitian compatibility. Again, I need to check all these details, but that's how, how I think this works. Um, so this is before we start dragging it around. So now we have to start thinking about dragging it around a bit. So what am I trying to say? Uh, uh, it would be, let's see. Well, so we've got, um, we've got, so what, yeah, <laughs> can you help me here? What would be the, what would, what, how, what would be the, how would, what would it mean to just drag this automorphy equation, uh, you know, to the left or to the right or up or down or something like that, just by some displacement? Um, so I guess just, I'd write, I guess I'd write V as like. Substitute V minus a displacement for V. Is that it? Or were you going to say something right. different? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, replace V with V minus something. And let's see, that would be all three occurrences or just the two occurrences on the left of V? Uh, uh, I wish I were good at this sort of thing. Um, or no, okay, maybe, right. Maybe, even if, maybe it's even better if we do just the occurrence of V on the right. Right, right. Just both occurrences or just the one? Just the one occurrence on the right. Uh -huh. Just the one occurrence on the right. Because, right, because we're just saying, you know, don't use, the Hermitian inner product, but use the displaced Hermitian inner product. Okay, yeah, that sounds more. I think that's right. I think that's right. So we're saying, you know, the Hermitian inner product of V plus the displacement and P. Uh, but, you know, it's bilinear, so that just breaks up into those two separate Hermitian inner products. And one of them doesn't depend on V at all. Uh huh. So do you see what I'm saying? Like I, I, I'm saying instead of, instead of introducing this dragging thing here, let's just, um, let, let me, I'm gonna write it down. Let's just, uh, you know, put in a, a, by a, a linear form here. In fact, I think it should be a complex linear form. Um, so this complex linear form, I need a, I need, you know, some random name for a complex linear form now. Do you have a preference <laughs> or suggestion? A letter uh, to use? 
D. I'm going to okay. use D unless you. That's fine. Okay. So D of P, I guess. One thing so, is that, that yeah, when your Hermitian form is non-degenerate, yes, then any exactly dragging, that's right. Any such D will come from a dragging, but if it's degenerate, not every D could actually pop out that way. That's exactly the point. Yes, that's right. That's right. So this is good. Yes. Why right. is so it that, good? <laughs> well, yeah, I think this is the correct thing here. I think this is the correct thing. So I think you know D should be a complex, a, an element of the complex dual of this vector space. But of course, the complex dual of this vector space is the same. It's really the same as the real dual of the vector space. Am I saying that right? I think that's right. Um, you know, the, the complex dual is really just the real dual with a sensible complex structure on. I mean, oh, right? The, the fewer complex linear maps. Uh, Am I saying this right? What, what do I mean? But I mean, the complex linear dual is the same. Yeah, but you can you could you have more scalars to multiply to compensate for. It. Um, am I saying that right? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm saying this in a very clumsy way, but I think I'm just you know saying some completely standard fact that uh, right. I mean, the complex dual of a complex vector space is the same dimension as the original vector space, but the real dual of a complex vector space is also the same dimension <laughs> as the, uh, you know, so they, they, they're probably the same thing, right? I mean, the, under, the underlying real vector space of the complex linear dual, that must be the real uh, linear dual. And it must be so for some completely trivial reason that I'm just failing to state in a, in, in a, in a way. Well, what I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to make an analogy between the the asymmetric bilinear form A here and the linear form D. I'm suggesting that they're be both being treated in a very similar way. That, right, you could start at, what am I saying this, right? Yes, you could start, consider this, start out with a real linear form, okay? Start it with having D be a real, real linear form instead of complex linear, but then create a complex linear form from D in a way that's very analogous to how we created a Hermitian form from A. In other uh -huh. words, you know, have D be like perhaps the original D, have that be the imaginary part or maybe the real part of this complex linear form. And, yeah. you know, tweak it to get the imaginary, part, the other part, the other component. So okay. do you see what I'm saying? There's something yeah, systematic. Well. There's something systematic going on here. I don't know how to say it in a very conceptual way yet, but there's obviously something very systematic going on here, in that we're treating this Hermitian linear form that comes from the anti-symmetric linear form. We're treating that in a very similar way to how we treat this complex linear form that comes from this real linear form. Uh, you know, so this right. There's some. <laughs> You know, people who are people who actually understand complex differential forms, maybe it's very natural to them to think about this. But I don't. I, I, you know, I would like a, I would still like a much more conceptual story. I mean, this is kind of like this. You know, there's some syntactic magic going on here. There's something very nice going on, but I. But I haven't really found the really nice way to state it yet. But but we're making progress here, right? This is a better answer to your question than I gave during the last time. During the last time, I just said that you. Oh, you just drag it, and you pointed out that that doesn't really work in the general case. So now we see that in the general case, you know, you use this dual thing, this linear functional, instead yeah. of this vector. Yeah. Hold on a second. Go ahead. It's possible our power will go out here. <laughs> power, um, literally yeah. power. <laughs> yeah, because of this solar power. Installation there. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's still getting, that, still getting the bugs at work. Yeah. So okay. if I suddenly disappear, 
Okay. Maybe a little, that I'll, I should be back. Um, sure. Did you really mean D of P or do you mean D of V, by the way? I would have meant D of P, but I've been known to get this confused before. See, because like the reason I think it's D of P is like what I'm saying is, what am I trying to say? That See, th th right, think about this. I mean, right, we're supposed to get, we're supposed to get this continuous parameter, right? Every component is the same shape as all the other components, of course. Right. But, but think of the actual identity component itself, the actual Picard variety itself. So, oh, okay. so I think it makes sense that for that line bundle that you're getting, that um, the automorphic condition would just be a constant automorphic condition, if you know what I mean. So for each, you know, for each period, I mean, right, or you, in order to write down the whole automorphic condition, you can, uh, you only have to write it down for the two generating periods. And often people, you know, rearrange things so that one of the periods, it's, it's trivial, uh, you know, that it's just yeah. strictly invariant on that period. And you put, you get the other period doing all of the work. That's slightly different from the way we have it set up, but we can think of it that way. So what I'm saying is, you know, you can think of functions on the complex plane that are, uh, strictly invariant under translation by one, and they are twistedly invariant under translation by I, for example, if we're doing the Gaussian lemniscate, but uh, twistedly invariant under, multi under translation by I, but, only, but the twist is only a constant. Um, am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. So in particular, let's see, oh, right now, see now I can't tell, are you, are you still there or did your power go out? Yeah, it does look a little bit like your power went out because you're not responding to me right now and you're just like frozen there. So maybe I'll wait. What time is it? It's five. All right, this is gonna be a chance to get a snack, I think. Yes, 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 I actually do want that. All right, let me get my notebook, let me get my paper notebook. I'm just supposed to wait, right? Let's see how it goes. I think so, because I'm in the Zoom room. This should be seven.
I am back. Hi there. You hear me? Hi. Oh. Hey. Uh. Hi. Let's see. I can't quite hear anything yet. What's what am yeah. I doing wrong? Oh. Can okay. You hear me? Now, now I can hear you. Yeah, I'm keeping it muted a lot because they're drilling in our wall. <laughs> Okay. Um, why can't I see my own picture now, though? I don't know. Well, I don't understand that yet. Um, I, I was just, while you were gone, I was making a paper notebook uh, note to myself. And I, I, I finished doing that. And um, right. Okay. So the last thing I remember before connections broke was you were asking me about how sure was I that I meant to apply this linear form D to the period P instead of to the vector V. Uh -huh. And right, and then I started trying to say that I think it really is P and my argument, my vague argument is in terms of thinking about the Picard variety. Uh, you know, think about those topologically trivial line bundles. So, yeah. you know, I'm suggesting, right, I'm suggesting that you, for those, you should get this uh, automorphy condition where, you know, you trans translate by one period And it's perhaps strictly invariant, and and you, you translate by another period, and it's twistedly invariant, uh, but but by a constant twist. I mean, you could also have it in spite instead of. I mean, the way we have it set up, it's 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 set up that, so that instead of being, am I saying this right? Instead of being invariant, strictly invariant under one period and constantly invariant under the other period, constantly twisted invariant under the other period. Um, what would it be? It would be like twistedly invariant by this real number in the one direction and then twistedly invariant by this other, I don't know, something like that. But um, what am I trying to say? I think it makes sense. I think it makes yeah. sense that, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. That you, you really do want these, um, uh, you know, con so-called constant automorphy factors for, the, for those uh, holomorphically non-trivial but topologically trivial bundles, uh, line bundles. And, um, and I'm also hoping that it will be obvious to us if we think about it a bit that there are no global solutions to that to that kind of uh, automorphic equation. Does that seem very plausible? That if you, you know if you put a constant factor, um, I mean, if there were, we would have heard about them, right? That's that's what you always say. Uh, they would be like. Holomorphic, like if D is zero, they would be holomorphic doubly periodic functions. But if D is non-zero, they'd be holomorphic twistedly periodic functions. But somehow, with a constant twisting, which seems very unlikely, because you know there are those theta functions that people talk about. Where it's definitely not a constant twisting; it's a variable twisting. So, if there right. was something even nicer than that, we would have heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. So, so what we're saying is that for am I saying it right? That for the for the trivial the, for the genuinely trivial line bundle that's trivial both topologically and holomorphically. For that one, you generally genuinely get solutions. Just the you know. 
the, the constants. And that is the constants. Those are the constant holomorphic functions on the variety. Those are the sections of the trivial bundle. But for any of these other ones, we're getting something that's, uh, I'm pretty sure, impossible to satisfy globally. So that, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Here we're getting, yeah. we're getting this very distinctive thing that, you know, you might guess that, right? At, at some point we were not, I think we were <laughs> naively guessing that the dimension yeah. of the sec section space didn't depend on right. the point within the component. But here uh -huh. we see that it really does. But we can still hope that, you know, that there's something Riemann Rock like that will somehow fix this anomaly, if you consider this an, an anomaly. Uh -huh. so, so that's about as far as I've gotten with, with that. Again, I still, I, I, you know, so I still got more work to do there. First of all, actually prove everything. But also I feel that, you know, there's something There's something nice that's going on that I haven't really figured out yet. You know what I'm saying in the, in, in, in the way that I'm saying that we've got this linear form and this bilinear form, and they're both being treated in a very similar way, but my story doesn't really account for the fact that they're both being treated in a similar way. In the story, they're just you know, like separate things that are doing different jobs. So I don't know. Do you have any comments about that? Do you have any insight into what's going on? Um, one little thing. Yeah. Is that <clears throat> so when, let's see, I want to see, <clears throat> so here it looks like D lives in the, the dual, <clears throat> Of, I'd prefer to think of it as like the complex vector space L tensor R. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? I, mean, I, I admit no. that the notation is horribly sloppy. Yeah. It's a, but, but what I'm wanting to see is that although it looks like D lives in this dual vector space, yeah. somehow the truly different Ds yeah. are points in the dual abelian variety right so the, so the two d's oh yes be the same thing if they are the same if yes. they are the same on l i guess yes okay that's that's a very good point that's an excellent point i guess i sort of meant to bring that up and it's very responsive to the question that i was asking what you're saying is obviously a big hint in coming up with the conceptual explanation of what's going on here. That, right, okay, in fact, in fact, one of the things you're pointing out here. If you stuck is, an I in front of that D, I would, or a two pi I or something, I would, I would say, okay, that's nice. Because then when- It uh, could be. Because <laughs> then when D is in the dual, Ah, let's see. When D is in the dual lattice, when D is in the dual lattice, then D of P is an integer. And so then like E to the two pi I of it would be one. And then it would be like it wasn't doing anything. It was, it was as if D was zero. Okay, I'm not trying to understand the notation well enough to change anything. Yet, I mean, the, the, the notation is so sloppy that I'm not sure I can fix it at this point. But, but I really appreciate the idea that you've just brought up. But let me try to restate your idea because you pointed out something that I completely omitted. So, you know, I was trying to say that there is this, I was trying to say that there is this mysterious resemblance between the way that we treat the linear form and the way we, we treat the bilinear form. But I completely omitted to state uh, one of the really important parts of that resemblance. And that is that they both relate to the lattice, but in different ways and sort of conceptually, conceptually opposite ways or 
ways that are like a level slip apart or something like that. So what am I saying? That the, the, in the case of the bilinear form, it has this integer valued property with respect to the lattice. And that's very crucial. But in the case of the linear form, it's what you said. And let me see if I can remember what you said or figure out what you said. So you, you're, you're pointing out that that lattice determines, when you stare at it correctly, that lattice determines uh, when, when two of these linear forms are, e are equivalent. So that in fact, the, the, the real classification is, the genuine classification is actually being parameterized by the dual abelian variety. Right. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So that, yes, so that, that's a big improvement over what I said, but I'm still looking for an even better story than that. I mean, I don't know, but. Sometimes I think all this yeah. stuff is, is just like linear algebra, but linear algebra, we have a vector space and a lattice in it. Right. And also, therefore, you have a, you get a torus and you could think of it. I mean, the abelian variety story sort of focuses on the on the torus as the, that's the star of the show. But yes, then when we're doing all these calculations, a lot of it is just like we're studying linear forms and bilinear forms and Hermitian forms, but all of which sort of you have more yes. to say about them in the presence of a lattice. Yes, 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 uh, yes. And maybe everybody else already knew about this, but I'm only just in the process of learning about it. Um, well, I've yeah. books on abelian varieties, that seems to be like what it boils down to, but they don't really come out and <laughs> say it. And so it's- I mean, I, I, Again, I, didn't, I just didn't get how, how simple it is. <laughs> you know, there's like this- Right, this is, yeah, well, this... they don't go out of their way to, to make it, seem that way maybe because they'd get paid less or something exactly exactly i mean this is the royal road and they're uh, just not you know this conspiracy to <laughs> keep people from knowing um so uh maybe we'll, we'll see how that goes but um yeah so so you know so this is this is where i'm stopping talking about this topic and let's see so that was like about an hour according to my clock is that right? We have another hour left. So that's good, because I think I've, well, I said I had one topic left, but while you were gone, I think I thought of another topic. Um, yes, let me, let me attempt to go back to the, okay, I gotta not use my ink pen to write on the electronic screen. So where did my, All right, wait a minute, it's gotta be around here somewhere. Give me a minute to see if I can find my uh, electronic stylus or whatever. Cause it really should be here somewhere. Look here, go. Well, that's a technical problem that I wasn't really expecting, that I lost my stylus, I have to find that. Um, but, uh, all right, so I'll have to try to uh, talk it through instead. So um, let, me, let me just add this extra third topic um, to the topic list. So I think this is a topic that sort of came up in email between you and me. And I sort of claim, 
I, I sort of claim that we've already figured the answer out, I think, to this question, but I don't think we've really spelled it out too much. But so let me state what the question was. So, uh, I mean, so one formalism that we've learned for dealing with uh, classifying the, the whole holomorphic line bundles over an abelian variety, or in other words, um, for understanding the neuron severity group of the abelian variety, is this formalism of Riemann forms, so-called Riemann forms. I mean, you know, those are these anti-symmetric bilinear forms that we've been dealing with, or perhaps the Hermitian forms that you create from them. Uh, so, so there's the Riemann form formalism. On the other hand, there's this other formalism that you read about, which has to do with the endomorphism ring of the abelian variety. And no. uh, you, um, I guess what you do is you sort of randomly pick a principal polarization on this abelian variety. And you use that to make this endomorphism ring into a star ring, is that right? So there's an, an anti-involution called the Rosati, Rosati involution. Yep. And then, I, I, you know, then, I'm, then I'm trying to remember, you know, once you do that, then things like polarizations or principal polarizations or ample polarization, well, I guess, polarization means ample, or just elements of the neuron severity group, these can all be characterized in, in terms of this, this Rosati anti-involution, or I guess people call it the Rosati involution, on this uh, endomorphism ring. And so let's see, uh, can we remember how that goes? So certainly self-adjoints, is something here. The, the self adjoints, those are the arbitrary elements of the neuron severity group. Is that right? Yeah, that's what they're supposed to be. That's what they say. And which ones are the uh, ample ones, the polarizations? Those are the ones in the image of this uh, self pairing or something twisted. This, I mean, you said something oh. like you take. You take a vector and you multiply it times it's, you take an element in this, you take an, an endomorphism. Oh, first of all, do you do this before you tensor with the rationals or after you tensor with the rationals? I guess this is before you tensor with the rationals. Sorry, they're making a lot of noise right now. Um, that's funny, I can't hear it. I can hear you. Oh, fine. good, well, that's great. Oh, that's I good. can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so they they tensor with the rationals and they make that tensored thing into a star algebra. And then they say that the guys in the original endomorphism ring yeah. that are self-adjoint are the uh, guys in the neuron severity group. And they say that the positive ones of those are the uh, polarizations. And I guess positive here means like strictly positive. So that they're not just like something times it's star, but there's like some strict positivity condition. Uh, amounts to saying that like it's if it was like a matrix like all its eigenvalues are greater than zero because they don't want to get the ones that are like right on the right on the borderline is that right you don't want to get ones that are on the light like in the abelian surface case you want to get the interior of the future light cone as being the ample yeah bundles, not the ones that are like right on the light cone. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, so yeah. Subtlety there. 
yeah, okay, yes, there are subtleties like this, and maybe I don't want to worry about too much about those subtleties. Now you remind me of how annoying they can get. Um, but, uh, okay, so one detail I didn't quite follow was, does the Rosati involution exist before you tensor with the, you know, does it even exist as, a, as, a, as an anti-involution before you tensor with the, tensor with the rationals. I thought maybe it did exist. Yeah, well, that's something that it's sort of puzzling me. They they don't seem, nobody seems to bother talking about it before they tensor with the rationals. All right. I can't tell if that's out of yes. laziness on their part or whether right. it right. doesn't exist. I think right. it might but, not exist. I saw, because there is some, they have some horrible formula for it that involves dividing by something. So it might not exist. But it'll be anyway. This would, this would be a great thing to talk about because it'd be good to like understand this or understand it better. <laughs> okay. Well, so I mean, I was going to claim that it should be almost obvious how to translate back and forth between the Riemann forms and these Rosati self adjoints. Um, Uh, um, because what am I trying to say that, well, right, right, okay. <laughs> it should be obvious, but that doesn't mean that I actually completely clarified it in my mind how it works. But I mean, it really reminds me of simply things like, right, there are certain contexts I, I'm, not, I'm not stating this in the best generality or anything like that, but if you have if you like if you have a vector space, let's say, and if you have, let's say, a finite dimensional vector space, for example, and if you have a non-degenerate bilinear form on it, then you can use that non-degenerate bilinear form to encode uh, operators as bilinear forms and vice versa, right? I mean, it's just, right, that, that non-degenerate bilinear form that becomes an index raising and lowering machine, lowering machine which lets you uh, you know sort of forget about the the directional variance of a of an index um, right. whether it's mm -hmm. up or down right mm -hmm. so um, yeah I think that's sort of the explanation for what's going on here we have one picture the Riemann forms those are these bilinear forms of one kind or another depending on how you construe it, versus these uh, Rosati self adjoints. Those are the operators. And we are precisely using one of those non-degenerate ones, one of those non-degenerate Riemann forms to, you know, to get this encoding. Um, so I think that's exactly what's going on here. Although you got me slightly worried now about this business with possibly we might need to tensor with the rationals first. But I'm not too worried about that. I still think it should work out somehow. Um, I, I mean, uh, you know, so I'm not, I'm not trying to give you the, the best answer here right now. I'm just saying that it seems like this should be very straightforward when we do eventually straighten it out, just because of this. This is all, I, this is all that I think is going on. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like it's gotta be basic. Thing that's going on. Uh -huh. So let's see. So, well, right. When we completely straighten this out, there's probably lots of nice things going on there. So, like, um, you know, in the Rosati picture, we've got this actual traditional Jordan algebra, but uh, we've been we've mentioned that there are these games you play where you can sort of change your mind, you, could, you can, in some sense, you can keep the same Jordan algebra, except change your mind about what the identity element is or something like that. And, yeah. and, and maybe, you know, so there's like a lesser structure than a Jordan algebra there. Is that, is, is that what's called quadratic Jordan algebra? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is? I mean, yeah, that's what, like McCrimmon for, yeah. And other Jordan algebraists 
said there's like a revolution in Jordan algebra theory where people realize that they should be using quadratic. Do you know what date, what, what did he date that revolution to any particular time uh, period? He did, but I forget. Okay. Um, so um, must have been a relatively long time ago, just not yeah. when Jordan was running around. Um, oh, well, Jordan was still running around in 1966, claiming that the earth was uh, <laughs> expanding. Oh, that's probably, they didn't invite him to the Jordan algebra conferences. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I, yes, I, I, I think that this, right. So it sounds like I'm claiming that you should actually maybe get a quadratic Jordan algebra of quadratic forms or something like that, instead of, of operators or something like that. You know, you get a Jordan, algebra of operators when you know once you pick your favorite non-degenerate bilinear form or non-degenerate quadratic form or something like that but um but if you don't pick one you just work you, you think of them as some sort of bilinear forms again i'm not sure whether they should be anti-symmetric or symmetric or whatever permission whatever but um if you just work with those, then it seems like that's probably going to be one of these quadratic Jordan algebras or something like that. Then there's also these Jordan triple systems that I learned about. I'm not quite sure how those relate to the quadratic. I think they're supposed numbers. to be almost the same. Thing. I think, yeah, I probably sort of understood it at one time, but I might, it might be worth relearning it for certain purposes of just clearing up this picture. But so, right, I, I think I'm mostly claiming that it should be very straightforward to understand this uh, equivalence between the Riemann forms, the Riemann form picture of the neuron severi group versus the Rosati self adjoint picture of the neuron severi group. I mean, I think, you know, I think when, once, you under, once you understand what's going on, it should be sort of hard to even notice the difference between these two ways of thinking. But nevertheless, somehow, it just seems like this Rosati self adjoint picture, it just seems awfully convenient. <laughs> it seems like uh, really useful for doing these calculations and things like that. Maybe particularly with these, I forget whether, I forget how you described it, but I mean, I was gonna say, you know, these abelian varieties that have cult complex multiplication um, of some kind. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so, so right. So uh, sp speaking of further- I mean, what, they, what those ahead. guys, what yeah, those guys, what the, what the experts seem to really like it for yeah. is that they, they show that like, you don't just get, any old Jordan algebra, you get a Jordan algebra that comes from a matrix algebra, I think over R, C, or Q, well, R, C, or H, uh, reals, complexes, or quaternions. Um, I mean, well, I, I forgot, to, I, I may have forgotten to ask you about that, that, uh, I mean, you were saying, you know, that you get into this whole Brouwer thing of classification of yeah. things over the rationals, but but if you just coarsely classify them over the reals, which is what you seem to be suggesting now, that 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 that's, gives you a very useful hint about what's going on, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess they want to classify them over the rationals, but what I've looked at, it seems like it's heavily influenced by the classification over the reals into this like tripartite classification. Right. Right. And I mean, part of what I was trying to say. Yeah, and part of what I was trying to say is that the the weirder formally real Jordan algebras, the spin factors and the exceptional one, they don't show up at all for some reason. Ah, uh, but but I mean this was a this was a silly wild guess that I was making. I was suggesting that maybe those would show up if we tried to get um
if we tried to get some more general, something more general than just abelian varieties involved, uh -huh. if we, you know, uh, I, I mean, it's just, uh, um, yeah, it's just a guess, and I'm not sure how much sense it's making now, but I had this vague idea that, you know, maybe for an arbitrary algebraic surface, um, yeah, you know, because those all those all look according to I think according to what you told me about one of those main theorems about algebraic surfaces is that they all have that intersection pairing that looks very uh, Lorentzian. Right. Those and, might. So those might the spin. Yeah, so I can imagine the spin factors. Yeah, I, I, that's what I'm hoping. That, that, that's my naive guess that maybe uh -huh. we should try to somehow unify those with these with these abelian varieties. Um, you know, get the uh, you know that maybe we should get it. Maybe we can or should get a Jordan algebra structure more generally than just for abelian varieties. Uh huh. Um, yeah. So anyway, I was just sort of trying to say that, like the, from what I gather from this book, the part of the power of this Rosati involution approach is that you can like really get your hands on the neuron severity group of abelian varieties very explicitly, and so that's that's yes. That's pretty cool. It's it's somehow yeah. So <laughs> it's somehow funny how just that. Well, it's nice how just that shift of point of view that you're talking about from the yes by or from the from the forms to the endomorphism yes. seems to like unlock these extra tricks. Yes. 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 Um. So um. So yeah, at some point I'd like to like dig, keep digging into that and like, yes. I don't know what, <laughs> understand examples more. We we're having lots of fun with, yes, the abelian surfaces over the Gaussians and the the, the especially nice ones over the Gaussians and the Eisensteins and a, so this yes, there's a lot there's a lot more direction. I'd like to do with that. There's a lot more I'd like to do with that, um, but. Um, but we're also having a lot of fun with uh, idle speculation about formal resemblances between how these Jordan algebras are helping us calculate neuron severity groups and how those Jordan algebras perhaps manifest in the context of uh, quantum measurement uh, ideas. Um, Did you have an actual speculation? I just had the idea of speculate. I mean, I, I don't know if I was the first time, <laughs> but there's the idea of speculating about it, but it's- Yeah, no, I have the idea actual... of speculating about it. I have the idea of speculating about it, but I mean- But is there, are you willing to proffer a speculation? No, part, no. part of part of what's yeah. yeah okay yeah I mean part of what sort of seems to be staring us in the face is that well I've worked I wrote this paper on Noether's theorem and Jordan algebras so I was thinking a bunch about Jordan algebras um, yes but I'd never thought about this extra layer which is in some sense we're doing Jordan algebras over at least some of what we're doing is Jordan algebras over number. Rings, yes. rings of algebraic integers. Yes, yes. So that's that seems mathematically really fun, but also you could try to make up some crazy yes. speculations about <laughs> quantum mechanics over <laughs> number rings. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. not so crazy as far as numbers. I mean, the create people stuff do like connecting quantum mechanics to number theory. Yes. Which mainly seems to be like you take some physics idea and you like apply it to number theory and you don't care too much if it ever gets back to helping you with physics right you could definitely do that kind right of right stuff. right uh but i i mean 
Right, but I, 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 was, I was trying to say something very nice. I was trying to say that, you know, I'm having fun visualizing the uh, convex cone of unnormalized density matrices uh, mm -hmm. for a three-dimensional Hilbert space or something like that. And um, and just thinking about how the same naive geometric picture is relevant in these two different stories that seem pretty different stories, but who knows? Um, it's you know the Jordan algebra is Jordan. Jordan may have invented Jordan algebra for the purpose of studying quantum measurement. On the other hand, uh, Jordan algebras are used in this. Neuron severity game. I mean, here's a wild speculation. So the way this neuron yeah. severity stuff shows up, yeah, is from really from decategorifying a two rig of yes generated by line bundles. Yes, and so so that makes it so that means that these Jordan algebra things or Jordan rings, they're really like decategorified versions of something <laughs> so there so there should be like a jordan two ring yes really yes. going on here yes yes yeah yeah I, right right yeah. We, we did already hint about that a little bit in the email yeah. yeah so so if it's really so if it's connecting to quantum mechanics it's, it could really be connecting to some kind of categorified quantum mechanics where, where you're using you know, star two rings and stuff like that. It's just funny. It's funny how like, like I thought of these line bundles as something that show up when you do geometric quantization, but then we're getting that like the whole thing of all line bundles resembles a, a star two ring which is like some kind of categorified quantum mechanics so i yeah there's this kind of microcosm business going on where you like have yes <laughs> quantum mechanics is hilbert, like hilbert spaces living in a two hilbert space or yeah but here we're doing something that seems much more sophisticated <laughs> to me Geometric quantization of one line bundle versus studying the thing of all line bundles is some kind of categorified quantization. It's, yeah, I don't know quite where it's going, but there's something funny going on. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if you were hinting at the same thing as one of the things I was thinking about, which is that We've got uh, this sort of star ring that we're dealing with. But on the other hand, you could also make a star category or a dagger category, whatever people call it, out of the quasi-coherent sheaves or vector bundles or something like that over um, one of these complex projective varieties, I think. I mean, I need to, that's that's another theme that I really need to think about. I mean, we have these two, that these, have, did you already say that? Maybe you already said that while I was trying to get little technical items to work here. Um, did, did you suggest that some of these two rigs that we're interested in may themselves be like dagger two rigs or something like that, or star two rigs? Again, there's, there's sort of like two different levels up there that you could talk about them being daggerish or star-ish, but that's sort of the point of what I was trying to mention. Yeah, I didn't quite say that. Um, yeah. I started so, thinking about that. I started thinking about that. I don't have any intelligence to say about it yet. Um, so now I'm tempted to switch to another topic. Maybe, maybe and I still have... Uh, you know, maybe it's secretly the same topic, but another another topic that uh, maybe I have a half an hour left here, possibly. Yeah, sure. Yep. So, um, 
I think this is possibly the topic that I did list as the second topic for today, which was uh, continuing with the Jugendtraum ideas. Mm -hmm. So I started talking about this last time, I forget, was it last 10 minutes, last 20 minutes, something like that. Uh, and I didn't get, didn't get very far, didn't expect to get very far, um, uh, but it was really helpful. It was really helpful, just kind of like clearing my throat, so to speak, uh, trying to recall the, oh, I did find the, Right here, okay. So I did find the pen. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, that um, I, I found it very helpful. The you know even 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 though I was just uh, stumbling through it last time, I found it very helpful trying to remind myself of how the idea is supposed to work. And I'm going to try to continue with it right now. But but that doesn't mean that you know. That doesn't mean that I'll do that much better this time either, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So on the other hand, I may, I may be starting almost from scratch this time. I mean, you know, maybe you don't even have to try to remember anything I said last time because I hopefully I have some better idea of how to approach the topic now. So I think, right, so I think one of the things I was trying to do, I was trying to give, I was, I was trying to start out, I was trying to start out with, um, with explaining a little bit about the art and reciprocity thing. And um, explaining how the Jugendtraum to the extent that I understand it, Kronecker's Judentraum has to do with something like taking Artin's reciprocity theorem, roughly speaking. I mean, even if I'm being anachronistic here, I still think this is sort of a way of thinking about it. You know, I don't know when Artin's reciprocity theorem came about, but, um, uh, that um, I, 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 I try to think of the Jugendtraum as involving starting with something like the art and reciprocity theorem, but then in special cases, trying to make it much more explicit and visualizable even. Um, and so, so that means I'm going to start trying to say something about what the art and reciprocity theorem is. And I think I started trying to say something last time too, but I'm going to, I, I'm going to try and take a, a different approach this time. So this is not at all like a textbook uh, discussion of the art and reciprocity theorem. Nothing at all like that, partially because I don't remember or never even knew the textbook approach to the art and reciprocity theorem. Uh, I suppose I should actually try to read Artin's textbook himself, though his, his own textbook, but um, I haven't gotten around to that, or if I did, it didn't seem to work, um, didn't seem to take. Um, so what am I trying to say? Uh, yeah, so this could be a very naive, perhaps wrong idea of, or defective idea of what the art and reciprocity theorem is about. But this is my idea. My idea is that roughly speaking, the art and reciprocity theorem is about the idea that you can understand abelian extensions of a number field by understanding the splitting patterns that are associated to them. Um, so what do we mean us by splitting pattern? We're talking about uh, the pattern of how primes split um, in going from the base field to the extension field, to the Sibelian extension field. And what do we mean by pattern? What we really mean is a congruence pattern. 
that you know each abelian extension of a number field is distinguished by corresponding to a particular pattern, a particular congruence pattern, congruence, a pattern defined in terms of congruences for how the primes in the base field split in the abelian extension field. And you know, it helps to just have like some really classic example in mind. And there is a really classic example, right? Which is, am I saying right? The Gauss, Gauss, what am I trying to say? Um, I guess we could take the integers as the base, well, or the rationals as the base. I mean, very often I think in terms of the integers in the field, the algebraic integers in the field, rather than the rationals. But um, so we have the rational field and we have the Gauss, the Gaussian, the Gaussian integers or the Gaussian rationals of that field, the Gaussian field as an extension field of that. And it turns out it's an abelian extension. Maybe it's obvious that it's an abelian extension because like it's only right, the Gaussian rationals is only two dimensional over the rationals. So if you think in terms of how big the Galois group could be, it sort of has to be order two and therefore abelian. But so what's the splitting pattern? The splitting pattern is just something about mod four, right? Uh, so what is it? <laughs> it's that if you want to, don't tell me. <laughs> Let me try to remember what it is. So, yeah, there's just two different congruence classes, mod four, and those you know, behave differently under this abelian extension. And so the ones that are equal to three mod four, those just kind of sit there. Mm -hmm. And the other ones, uh, split into two primes. There also might be some very exceptional case that I'm not thinking about. I don't remember about <laughs> that. I like think it's ramified or something. There might be yeah. one even prime. It's been rumored. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. The, I think that's the exceptional case, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I, I, but I mean, what do I know? I mean, there's also, you know, Conway likes to think of uh, negative one as a prime, and that's sometimes oh. useful. Okay, so I, well, that's even, yeah, okay, that's more far out, yeah. I'd have to think about whether that's ramified here, or if that even makes sense, I don't know. But but I can just, you know, sweep those exceptions under the rug, sweep all the ramification under the rug for a moment, because those sort of don't follow a pattern, or at least they don't follow, right? You're trying to argue that it really does follow a pattern, that, you know, two does, behave in a way that's appropriate to its congruence class mod four, but it just happens to be the only one that is in that congruence class mod four. Um, but, um, so, you know, the, 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 the facts about this being an extension, they can be rephrased in terms of certain semi-famous theorems, like I guess it's called the two squares theorem, or is there a person who is, maybe there isn't a person, but, it's a theorem, the two squares theorem that you can, yeah. So what does that say? That says that you can tell when a prime is a sum of two squares. Is that right? Um, no. Because it's congruent to one mod four. And secretly that's a fact about how these things are behaving in the Gaussian integers and stuff like that. Um, so if you just think of that one example, the, the art and reciprocity theorem is sort of just saying that it's all like that. That um, anytime you, anytime that you have an abelian extension, I said abelian extension of a number field. I'm not even sure the exact definition of a number field. Or it should be a definition of a number field. It's probably, the art and reciprocity theorem is probably true for any field, for being extensions of any field, I would guess. Just not sure how to phrase it that way. But, um, so, I mean, one way you can think about what this is saying is that if you stare at things right, you can construe these splitting patterns as being sort of like, is it 
homogeneous actions of this absolute abelian Galois group. And you know, you could sort of reconstruct the whole profinite abelian, absolute abelian Galois group by you know, this sort of Tanakian approach where you sort of know what the actions are. I mean, I, I, again, I, I tend to associate the word Tanakian with the case where you're looking at linear representations of a group. But, uh, and then, but then I tend, the, 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 the variant on that idea where you use the actions on sets, I think I tend to associate that with the idea of the Grotendieck Galois group or something like that. I don't know. Um, but um, if you could figure out if you could figure out how to uh, construe these splitting patterns as actually telling you all about all of the actions of the profinite Galois group, I guess all of the continuous actions of this profinite Galois group. So those continuous actions tend to be very finitary or something like that for a profinite group. Um, you know, if you could reconstruct this whole topos of the actions of this whole topos of continuous actions of this profinite Galois group, then in, in principle, you could re reconstruct the whole group that way. And so you'd be getting a whole lot of information about this topos or this profinite group or this number field, all these things are, so you, so the, the art and reciprocity theorem is supposed to do a lot of this work. Maybe when you, maybe when you really understand how the art and reciprocity theorem it works, maybe in ways that I don't quite un fully understand it yet, maybe it completely does this job. Maybe you can like, you know, completely reconstruct everything, you know, the whole profinite Galois group, just from thinking of these splitting patterns as telling you what the actions of that, pro what the continuous actions of that profinite group are. You meant profinite abelian Galois group, I guess. Or do you really want to go all the way out into the? No, I probably meant profinite absolute abelian Galois group. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, certainly we do eventually want to get into what you're saying, but, yeah. but to begin with, the art and reciprocity theorem doesn't really try to get past the abelian variant. Um, so what am I trying to say? That, uh, that also checking the clock here. Okay, everything's fine. Um, that um, well, okay. So so there's a sort of uh, complication that arises in this simple-minded story that I've just been trying to describe um, that makes it a little bit less, the complications make it a little bit less simple-minded. So what am I trying to say that, um, see, as long as primes are genuine numbers, then talking about congruence, um, conditions that a prime satisfies makes completely good, obvious sense. I guess, the, I guess even there, there's a slight complication because which representative do you use for a prime, right? You can multiply by any unit in the number ring and that could affect the congruence class. But anyway, but, e e but even beyond that, when you start dealing with prime ideals that are not necessarily prime principle ideals, then it becomes less obvious how to talk about congruence conditions that a, uh, that a prime satisfies. But if you think about it, it's not that bad. I mean, so what am I trying to say here? That right, so a principal ideal 
has, you know, it, it's, 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 well, so first of all, okay. So one thing, one of the things is that these prime ideals in a number ring, they are, these number rings are dedicated rings or something like that. And prime ideals in a number ring are really invertible modules. So they're like these line objects or line bundles, morally speaking. I mean, that's right. This is providing my whole excuse for, you know, how do we start talking about the human oh, and, and, and the uh, art and reciprocity yeah. theorem yeah. when the, when our initial topic was all about holomorphic line bundles over periodic varieties? Well, this is one of the key loose threads that we're trying to investigate here. Um, the way that these uh, line objects uh, appear in the story of the art and reciprocity theorem and the Jugendtraum. Um, so, uh, what am I trying to say? That the, the presentation of a principal ideal as a module, as an invertible module, I mean, never mind that it's invertible, just think of it as a module for a moment. So, it's got a presentation as a module. But if it's a principal ideal, then that presentation is completely trivial. It's just one generator, nothing else. Yeah. Whereas if you start having non-principal ideals and you write down their presentations as modules, I think there's something that says that you can always get away with just having two generators or something like that, but you need a relator connecting them as well. Um, but having these two generators means that you can look at the congruence classes of those generators. Uh -huh. uh, right. So, so right when we talk about con con congruence, when we talk about congruence conditions on a principal idea, we're really talking about congruence conditions on a generator for that principal idea. Well, so if you're doing congruence. If you want to generalize congruence conditions to a non-principal ideal, you just have to think about congruence conditions on the, the multiple generators of that ideal. Uh, and so when you start reading the fine print of the art and reciprocity theorem and it starts looking complicated, that's really one of the things that's going on. That's my that's my theory about why it starts looking complicated. There's actually something very simple going on, but you just have to deal with the fact that you have to generalize the concept of congruence condition um, that makes perfect sense, that makes very naive sense, naive good sense for principal ideals. You have to generalize that so that it makes sense for more general ideas. And um, so, So that's that's what's going on here. That's what's that's that's an important theme in what's going on here. Now I still have another ten minutes before I should really quit. So I haven't succeeded in saying yet. At least this time, I haven't succeeded yet in saying anything about. I mean, I'm supposed to be explaining the Jugendtraum. The Jugendtraum has a whole lot to do with abelian varieties and abelian varieties with complex multiplication. Originally, particularly, uh, uh, what would it be? It would be, um, it'd be elliptic curves with complex multiplication, right? Mm -hmm. And those would be related to quadratic number fields. Um, but what, so what am I trying to say here? What am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say, and so this is another blind stab at trying to say what I'm supposed to be saying. So, uh, yes, I still don't have my, 
electronic drawing tablet optimized. I may be stuck with paper here a little bit. I might be holding some paper up to the screen or something like that. But what am I trying to say? See, there's something very visual going on here. There's something very visual idea. I mean, a very stupid, naive level. I want to say something like that the Jugendtraum is what you get if you take the ideas that you learned about clock arithmetic when people are trying to explain to you, you know, the integers mod p or the integers mod n, right? In when I when I was in elementary school, when I was reading math books for fun, they would talk about clock arithmetic when they're explaining the integers mod p, or perhaps famous example is the integers mod 12, if you really want to talk about classical clocks. Um, if you start combining clock arithmetic If you start combining clock arithmetic with multidimensionalness, then you semi in inevitably run into the idea of the, the Jugendtraum. So in other words, we're gonna be looking a lot at abelian varieties, but we're gonna be wrapping them up. We're gonna be sort of look, yeah, we're gonna look at like, we're gonna be doing things like looking at, taking some abelian variety, taking the, thinking of the abelian variety as an abelian group, taking the subgroup of like the P torsion subgroup of that abelian variety or something like that. So that's gonna be a little, finite thing. And it looks like the kind of clock arithmetic that you learned about, in, that I learned about in elementary school, except that it's like multidimensional. So there's like these multidimensional. Yep. Right, right, right. So it's it's like these it's it's like it's like all about understanding these multidimensional donut clocks, you know donut. That's the naive way of understanding what a torus is, what a two dimensional real torus or one complex dimensional torus is. An elliptic curve. An elliptic curve looks kind of like a donut, surface of a donut. But then we're gonna have these like yeah. Go ahead. What are you trying to understand about them? I mean, so. As groups, they're just under. I guess people worry about like the rational points of them. Or so, what's the Yugen Traumi thing? To, well, that's I what I'm struggling to say. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm getting impatient. Yeah. Okay. So, well. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're go gonna run it. out of time soon, one way or the other. So. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what am I trying to say? Um, so the Jugendtraum says, you know, I'll have, obviously I have to try to say this much better in future ex, future discussions. But the Jugendtraum says that <coughs> what does it say? <coughs> All right, I'll, I'll make an attempt to say it right here. The, the Jugendtraum says that you can, well, first of all, that you can get a Galois representation So, okay, you've got, let's say, for example, a quadratic number field, like the Gaussian integers. Mm -hmm. There's an associated elliptic curve with complex multiplication. Mm -hmm. 
There might, there might actually be a whole bunch of associated abelian varieties with complex multiplication by the Gaussian integers. For example, we look at this abelian surface with complex multiplication by the Gaussian integers. But to begin with, let's just think about, you know, this elliptic curve that we get as basically the complex numbers modulo the Gaussian integers. Now, you can get a Galois representation of the absolute Galois group of the Gaussian field. You get a Galois representation of that by having it act on, well, first of all, you get a Galois representation of that over the finite field Z mod P by taking the P torsion points on this elliptic curve. So you're thinking of them as like a vector space over FP? Yes, yes. And then, and then the Galois group. Yes. On that. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Okay, that's nice. And the Eugentram is going to tell us that that Galois representation is secretly the same or almost the same as another representation. And that's going to be something like, I want to say something like, it's going to be a representation of the multiplicative group. I'm not saying this exactly correctly yet, but it's going to be something like a representation of the multiplicative group. I want to say it's like a representation of the, it's going to be like the tautological representation of the multiplicative group of G, sorry, uh, it, it's, it's gonna be a tautological representation of GL1 comma FP. I'm not saying this right yet. <laughs> it's gonna be, It's going to be like the. See, I mean, it's something like the, this Galois group. It's going to be very related to the multiplicative group of the Gaussian integers. But it's going to be, I'm not saying this right, but it's going to be more like some profinite limit of finite quotients of this multiplicative group. But these. I think we have to stop. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, forgot we should, <laughs> I, I forgot we should stop a few minutes early.